Hey, everybody, it's Lance Dawson. I am back here this week with my buddy, Andrew Stewart, for yet another episode of Backstage Lowdown. Both Andrew and I are super excited uh, this week because we have Neil Osborne, writer, creator, singer for 5440, the iconic Canadian rock band. And uh, he is in the hot seat with both Andrew and I this week, and we are so looking forward to talking to him. So here we go. Good, good. How was vacation? Uh, good. It was really good, actually. Just went down to Hilton Head. Nothing fancy, but you guys uh, I get drive it. or uh, yeah. did you fly down? Yeah. No, no. Just drove. It's like a day and a half. We like road tripping, so that's that's nice. kind of fun. The vacation for me starts when I get in the car, so I don't I don't lament having to drive. Um, yeah, it was really cool. I have a video to show you on my film or on my film on my camera. Uh, I had just we had just finished going for a morning run. And about a hundred feet from our front door is a lake, small lake, like a pond. Right. And there was this huge, and I emphasize huge alligator that lived there and not like seven feet, like 12 feet, massive gator. And he was right by the shoreline. And as I ran or walked by, um, I'd never seen this before. He reared up in the water and roared. Yeah. Wow. yeah like, like a lion. And, uh, and so quickly I went, uh, cause again, this guy is very close to where, you know, we were staying. So I went over and, uh, and grabbed my phone and, uh, and then came back and videotaped him. Cause he was equally, he just kept, I think he was mad at me. Yeah. I don't know why. I am not a gator, not a gator fan at all. No, <laughs> no. Or no fan of anything that can kill you. No, exactly. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a, that was a highlight. Anyway. I, I thought you were going to tell me that you had a video from the, the Rainbow Bridge that you were involved in. Yeah, that was a surprise. No, we were we were down there wondering, are we going to be able to get back? Because I know initially they closed all the bridges to make sure that, you know, this is not going on at every bridge. Right. So for those of I don't know when this is going to actually be made public, this podcast. But anyway, last week there was a like was it two guys that were there at the casino they were drinking a lot no and it was barreled uh, their car into the bridge or something and it blew well, up i i don't know if they had been drinking a lot but um it was a couple kurt and monica oh. we'll call her mon for the purpose of the the podcast so <laughs> like they had their own dukes of hazard moment as they probably flew up 25 feet in the air okay i think i don't know if it was that they're uh, the accelerator got stuck on their Bentley, but like this thing flew up over top of trees. Like that takes a lot to get a Bentley that high in the air. It was a Bentley that they were driving. Yeah. No, they, uh, wow. it's, it's a couple mid fifties. They own a lumber yard plus a bunch of, um, like equivalent to home hardware here. I guess they own like something like five or seven of them. Wow. In, um, in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Un it was unfortunate that they didn't survive. But I mean, I just, I, I swear, at one point, the video stopped. Mon turns to the side, gives a little gunshot, and uh, and then the, the freeze frame stops, and then they continue. Maybe they Thelma Louise it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just, uh, I'm picturing Dukes of Hazard. I was a big Dukes of Hazard fan. Yeah, I like the Dukes of Hazard. Were you were you a Bo or a Luke guy? Mm. I see you as a Luke. Uh, yeah, I'm probably. Saying I the dark, I'd the dark prefer to be guy. asked if I was a Ginger Mary Ann guy, but as long as we're gonna go with the Dukes of Hazard, I suppose I was a Luke guy. Yeah, uh, Mary Ann is my answer. Yeah, yeah, I think most people. Yeah, like I mean, I I appreciate Ginger, uh, certainly. Hmm um you know how about how about <laughs> I can't, this could go so sideways and in, in going into uh you know sort of 70s 80s bad television mm. shows because in, in the world of great wkrp television. wkrp yeah. oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 
this is why we're friends. This a is great a great moment. Terrible geeky moment. I, I of... saw a t-shirt for sale for their annual um turkey toss. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every Thanksgiving that comes out. I love that one. As yeah. God is my witness, I thought turkeys could fly. Best best episode ever. <laughs> no, I was more of a Bailey than a Jennifer. Uh, more Bailey um quarters yeah. than Jennifer Marlowe. Yeah. No, I I'm picking up what you're laying down. Thank you so much for hanging with us today. I really do appreciate it. No worries. My are you are you out west right now? Are you out in BC? Yeah, I'm at home, in home, whatever, on Gabriola Island. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm going to ask a, a really off the top question. You have two guitars in the background. One's a Telecaster. It looks like it's got some TV Jones pickups on it. Is the other one a Stratotone it above is. you? Yeah. Nice. There's a silver tone over there and another Fender and there's a whole slew of them over here oh look at that look at that i'm and gonna is, I mean, to... a good one here that's uh at dave gen's place so that my 57 esquire which is wow like a really my legitimate toy. 57 esquire yeah like springsteen had yeah only original yeah. i didn't carve it up like he did <laughs> did his ever get to the hall of fame or did he lose it somehow no he still got it i don't know it's the one on the on the cover of Born to Run, right? That's a yeah, fifty seven Esquire. That's the one. amazing mine, anyway. Yeah. Well, we could go down a we could go down a real wormhole here talking about guitars, my friend. We could do that. Yeah, that's um, a Dave, that's more Dave Gens world, but I I know a fair bit. Yeah, I, I well, I think you do. You're certainly a good player, anyway. So that's awesome. So, are you guys gearing up for you know? It was Andrew and I were just talking about the the album, the West Coast. Uh, band how's that doing and are you guys on tour with that right now uh yes and no i mean it's it's doing good seems like people you know i don't know how anything is doing anymore that's that's a very relative question you know used to used to be in the old days you'd get the numbers from sony or warner brothers saying you know we did yeah. five thousand today or you know six thousand this week or whatever it would be right um, we're on projections or whatever. And now I don't know what that even means. How's it doing? Music has really changed since yeah. uh, since you guys started playing. I mean, you, you've seen cassettes, you've seen CDs, MP3s. Um, um, yeah, what were those digital things that came out very, very briefly? Gosh. They were mm. like dats, but they were, they were discs. Mini discs. Yeah, the, mini yeah. discs, that's right. Yeah, but yeah, I totally when, forgot about those. Yeah. yeah I, know. I don't right. think that was a medium that lasted too long, but at least in those, as long as it was on, as long as it was a, hard, a hardcore medium, then at least the band and the songwriter and everybody was getting sort of paid per unit. I think with the like streaming just sort of destroyed all of that. Yeah. My yeah. estimation. And you're right. You're right, Neil, to say that like it used to be platinum and diamond and albums go gold and that sort of thing. And I don't hear that too much anymore. I don't know what what you base anything on, to tell you the truth, other than maybe, you know, uh, an accidental hit like uh, Mother Mother with their TikTok sensation that everybody's <laughs> like, how the heck? And they don't even know. <laughs> hey, man, I'll, I'll give you props for knowing what TikTok, I mean, we, I guess we all know what TikTok is, but... Uh... It's yeah. a train wreck is what it is. I mean, yeah. it, I had to take TikTok off my phone because once you start watching it, you cannot look away. All of a sudden yeah. you've wasted two hours of your day. And Very for what? much like when you walk through a casino and you see all the people at those. <laughs> exactly. You're not even like, you know, it's not even like a pinball machine where you can kind of maybe jiggle it a little bit to get it in your favor. <laughs> you're pressing a button and the computer goes, not you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so neil talking talk to me a little bit about this this album we had so many questions because you're it's you're part of such an iconic canadian band and i was i was trying to talk to a few people 
uh, today, just because I knew I was going to get to talk to somebody from 5440 and mm -hmm. just about how, you know, bands like 5440, the Tragically Hip, Blue Rodeo, Bare Naked Ladies, they're all part of uh, sort of the pantheon of Canadian uh, rock history. And it's it's really, it really is a pleasure to get to talk to somebody who's who's a part of that uh, fabric. So again, I'll thank you for being here. The the new album, like when I've when I've heard you guys do interviews before, um, I know that you spoke strongly just about, hey, you know, we were big punk rock fans and that was, you know, part of our influence. I feel like that's really come back with this new album. Like uh, certainly the title track is, has really got um, just, you know, guitar beat anthem type of punk stuff. So congratulations on that. But how was that? Was that a big part of of you writing this album? Was that sort of to return to some of that root stuff or not so much? Um, that song in particular has that feel and that vibe. You know, we, we've talked about it uh, in the past. Well, amongst ourselves. <laughs> um, how it reminds us of a band we still like, like quite a bit called The Pointed Sticks out of Vancouver. And okay. They were sort of the first... They're part of the punk scene, but they weren't really a punk band. They were kind of like a punk pop band. And I think they got signed to Stiff. So they were the first band out of Vancouver, out of the new wave underground it was called underground music in those days right, right. um out of that scene they could sort of get a record deal and yeah so they had sort of a pop sensation but and a punky attitude so that was the thing about vancouver scene it was more the attitude rather than the sound you know right what punk sort of emerged i mean i could have this all wrong but my perspective is you know we used to go down to california a lot in the early 80s and then there's a punk scene that emerged that was very thrasher and skateboard vibe. Yeah. Stuff, that that became sort of the American punk scene. But in uh, Vancouver and Seattle and San Francisco, those three cities and Portland, I guess, to some degree, it was anything that had an attitude that was anti-establishment, you know, more embracing the anarchy vibe as much as anything. I have so, a question about that. Would you agree that, um, cause we were talking about this a little while ago too, that where punk, uh, I believe, came out of sort of England, and mm -hmm. it was it came from a bunch of really angry guys about angry about what the government was doing, um, you know, the, yeah, the state of the state of the thing, of right? And so what you're um, what you're referring to actually fits that. But I felt like sort of when it came to North America or certainly Canada, it it transitioned from less about government, you know, being ticked off about the man or whatever, and more about there was a definite fashion undertone to to punk as well or or maybe that kind of overshone it wasn't as angry i don't know what do you think uh well i think any there's always youth rebellion you know and youth youth right. rebellion and music were very much aligned you know until it got sort of co-opted <laughs> somewhere along the way yeah uh, so that the, uh, in those days, yeah, fashion was was a way you made a statement that you weren't like everybody else. That's that kink song, I'm not like everybody else. Yeah. That held true. And, and bringing back that attitude was a big part of it. So in that sense, it was legit and valid. It wasn't quite the political scene that, yes, certainly bands out of, you know, England, especially The Clash, I guess. Right. Uh, we're talking about, but... It was it was aligned, I think. Yeah. I felt. Do like you think? Was. Do you think that one of the reasons fifty four forty was able to elevate and, uh, themselves and and stand out was because um, you know when you guys talk about your influences, like you just uh, cited that other band from Vancouver, that the influences were not of the top forty bands. Like the influences that you guys all had were not necessarily mainstream bands. And so, do you think that 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 was a factor in the reason that 5440 became pretty unique as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, we all had, well, Brad and I, especially because we were in high school together, had a common musical taste. Uh, you know, when we first met in middle of grade 11, was like, uh, of course, we had background in the 60s stuff, Neil Young, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, right. you know, right. good foundation there. And some earlier stuff with Rockabilly and Eddie Cochran and whatnot. Then we both got into like Genesis, and the art rock and Pink Floyd and all that. Then we got into fusion, you know, Alda Miola and Jean-Luc Ponty. We went to Jean-Luc Ponty together because um, even though all the kids around us were, you know, had bought Fleetwood Mac rumors and, you know, uh, 
Peter Frampton Comes Alive and all those records that everybody had. We were familiar with it, but it wasn't something that we would, you know, be go raging. out and watch a concert. Yeah, or, you know, although we did go to some concerts for sure. But then when that scene came along, it, it was definitely something that inspired us. Felt like you could belong to it. Uh, and it, it called out to us, you know. And then you found like-minded people out there. You know, there was a time, and I think you've seen movies about it in the past, where, you know, your musical taste decides whether I'm going to like you or hang out with you or not. You sure. Because <laughs> those well, were the days where people well, would, you know, hey, you know, Neil, come on over. I just got the brand new, you know, 5440 album. Let's take a listen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That doesn't so, happen anymore. No. And if you say you got the brand new Billy Joel or ABBA album, I'd go pass, you know, and then I wouldn't talk <laughs> to you more. Although nowadays I'd be like, cool. <laughs> cool let's do it. Let's get I, some I, wine I, and listen. Yeah. I can't <laughs> oh, lure sure. you with any shikatita. That's not going to do it for you. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and so a lot of British bands influenced us at the time, you know. Um, so that was our our template, really, to get going. Fantastic. Theme, really. Yeah. I know that as you talk about, you know, you uh you become friends with people that have similar uh, similar musical tastes and i can remember back in it was 92 uh you guys i think it was called the great canadian party that you played at and uh it was in ontario i think it was up in barry actually mm -hmm. and uh myself and a buddy uh had headed out from his place hitchhiking in the middle of the night trying to make it to a another guy's place who he was friends with and you know eventually we we made it there i ended up sleeping on the floor but it was just a, a large group of people that were of the similar mindset who enjoyed the same same sort of music and we just went and had a great time together in amongst several thousand other people who had yeah. the same same mindset so you you've got a thousand of your best friends standing around you yeah just because of the music that's being played and and the feeling that uh that it leaves you leaves you with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now it still goes on you know i uh, this is probably thinking five years ago now uh, there's those lost covid years so you never know how yeah it is but uh i i went and saw the cure out in here on the west coast deer lake park which is park that holds about nine thousand people beautiful day and uh everybody there was mostly over 40 you know and it was like Makes a love. Sense. everybody just loved being there and there was no it wasn't like over the top crazy but it was great it was just and i found the whole thing as as dave again our guitar player his his biggest band that he loves the most is he just he just loses it but uh, you know, i found it i told him he said he asked me what I thought. And I said, it's very reassuring, you know, very reassuring that there's that music and all these people that were there. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it was just a nice foundation experience. The other thing is about yeah. that show is that uh, the stage, Live Nation didn't have a proper stage. So they couldn't hang all their big video screens. So it made it way better because everybody could see. And it was like the old days when I used to go yeah. to bands. You know, I, I went, I spent, the only time I've actually had to spend tickets twice, uh, tickets to see a show, you know, because you know, in the business, you just yeah. don't, right? Professional courtesy, as they say, like lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, was I had to take my little kids to see the Spice Girls when they were in their peak, which was very fascinating. And then the second time was about, I don't know, eight years ago, I took my wife, my daughter and my sister and I paid thousand bucks to see paul mccartney and all i did honestly was watch tv like because he was so far away he was like this big and then there's these giant screens and it's like i paid a thousand bucks wow to watch friggin tv and i could go home and watch the beatles on the ed sullivan so way more exciting i mean it was still good but yeah i don't know i just find i'd rather i'd rather not have that screen and then just take in more of the environment and the people mm -hmm. that are there and the collective you know i also saw i saw uh springsteen speaking of which at on the board of the usa tour at the uh 
Pacific, Pacific Coliseum, and it was like a religious experience. It was crazy. And I wasn't that big of a fan, but it was all a buzz. I was like, better yeah. go. And, uh, you know, everybody was standing up from the beginning to the end. And you know, he goes, and this one goes out to the next king of rock and roll. And I'm like, he's talking to me. <laughs> me and they're all going, he's talking to me. <laughs> was, he was talking to everybody. It was yeah. crazy. Oh, that's so, awesome. But he was my uh, he was my first con concert going to see uh, was Springsteen. So yeah, I, you know, bought the five tickets. times, and that nothing was like that first time. But what my point is the the environment, right? Without the screens, even though you know he's this big or this big or whatever, uh, you're part of the collective of all the people there, and there's that energy, and you really tune into it. Whereas if you're just zoning in on a screen. You're not aware of anybody else around you. You're all in your head too much. And that's not what music's supposed to do. It's supposed to relate. Yeah. I'd say one step, one step away too is that back in the day we were all at a concert and nobody had phones. No one was looking at you know, my wife calls them through the lens people that yeah. they're not experiencing the moment. They're just looking at it through a lens, in which case we you could have just watched it on YouTube. Why yeah. waste a thousand dollars? Yeah. Yeah, I can't so I even think, pick yeah. up my phone to use it as a lighter because I, I just feel that it, it takes away from the experience when I'm watching a concert. Yeah, but there's something to be said, too, for I don't know, maybe I guess I'm showing my age because I know when I was younger, Neil, I agree with you. It was sort of a religious experience seeing Springsteen at a stadium with, you know, 80,000 of your closest friends. But <laughs> now I just saw you guys last isn't it last year. I don't know. I'm with you. The COVID years kind of messed me up, but um Lowest the low open for you. It was in London. And okay. uh, we went down to see 5440. And I don't know. I think there's, I'm sure that you may relish the days opening for the Stones, being at the Saddle Dome. That's like the pinnacle. But for guys like me, I, I just love seeing bands that I enjoy in a more intimate setting where mm -hmm. I can see you. You're not 10 miles from where I am. And then I walk away thinking, yeah, I, I shared something with 5440 tonight and lowest of the low. And those guys were great. And you know, sometimes in the stadium, I, I kind of lose that. So I like it when the bands are not maybe quite as as big playing the Saddle Dome. I know that's selfish. The bands themselves are like, no, the Saddle Dome is where it's at, man. <laughs> you know, but do you it's do you feel fun. like it's is it more is it more I don't know how to phrase this. Is it more intimate for you guys when you play a smaller venue versus you know what everybody's supposed to be trying to reach is is the the Saddle Dome kind of deal? It's different energies in in each environment, right? Sometimes, right. like we we do an annual stand at the Horseshoe, you know, and it's nice, it's kind of a shithole, really. I mean, it yeah. be honest. but it rocks like hell. I mean, the sweat starts from the first bar, and it's that spirit of rock and roll that you just can't get anywhere else, you know, or very few other places. So that's why we keep going back and our fans seem to want us to keep going back. You know, we've always talked about well, maybe we should play, you know, somewhere once instead of doing a three night stand once in a bigger place. And I don't know that that that's that case. Got, right. Got the well, energy. Yeah, theaters like a lot of sit down venues sometimes. Uh, and that's more intimate. You know, you talk more, you know, you kind of. Right. Once again, you work the room a little bit in the environment that you're in and then sometimes the bigger venues like we just played a an old horse and buggy track racetrack it was about nine thousand people out out here and uh it was nuts and it was very exciting um yeah i mean if i was in the audience i don't know if i'd enjoy it as much as some of the more intimate stuff but the energy was there that's for yeah. sure do you find are you still able to attract some younger fans, or the, are the parents bringing their kids out saying you got to listen to some Canadian history here? And <laughs> I don't know what parents say to their kids. Um, yeah, we we definitely see a, a a mix of people. I mean, generally, you know, there's the sweet spot, which is, I guess, somewhere between forty five and fifty five, maybe maybe fifty to sixty, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, but always there's younger folks maybe they're kids maybe they just like classic rock maybe they like canadian rock i don't know i mean i don't really do a survey but no it was there. just nice i was nice when we saw you in london that I, I have to say i don't think there was that many phones you know what yeah. i mean yeah i i, I don't recall <laughs> <laughs> well you were busy you were working you see the phones yeah. all the time you know yeah, yeah. that's just part of the yeah. deal now that's what it is right, all right.
So I have a question for you uh, that goes back to your musical influences, and it it's going to border on a topic that you've been asked a gazillion times. So you can answer my question and, you know, whatever. But you were talking about these, you know, different bands that that influenced you. And um, I know that when Metallica started out, they used to play, before they could write their own stuff, they would, there was some band that they really loved over in Europe and no one knew their song. So they played that and to launch themselves. Mm -hmm. And it must have been uh, somewhat flattering to know that Hootie and the Blowfish were kind of doing the same thing. They played a bunch of 5440 songs when they were touring colleges because they loved you guys. And mm -hmm. maybe down where they were playing, uh, nobody knew who 5440 was. So I don't think they were passing it off as, as your stuff. Um, and I only know this because um, hey, my wife was listening to Sears XM. Darius Rucker was hosting as a DJ. And, uh, everybody always asks us about uh, I Go Blind. And I'm telling you, that's not our song. We we used to play 5440 stuff. That's how that happened. So I just wanted, I know everybody that I, when I said I was talking to the guys from 5440, it was like, you gotta ask him about I Go Blind. I was like, I, yeah, like that has not been done before. But it must have been nice, Neil, knowing that you you and Brad equally influence some pretty great bands out there, like these other bands influenced you. That's a huge feather in your cap, right? Like that's that's cool. Did you remember how that felt or? Um, well, you know, it's a good feeling. We're kind of more into where we're going rather than where we've been. But it's nice. It's, you know, it's equally significant when some kid comes up to me and say, you know, Ocean Pearl riff was the first thing I learned. Um, you know, Rain Miat, Matt Miat or whatever his name is from Our Lady Peace, you know, love the Fight right. for Love record and it made him want to be a singer. Stuff like that. Those guys, yeah, they used to come and hang out. Um, I think this was even might have been before Darius was in the band, to be quite honest. But I can't remember. We used to play the 930 Club in Washington. Okay. They, they came to see us a few times and they were, yeah, a cover band. And they played a lot of REM and a lot of 5440. So, you know, that's cool. It's, yeah, it's it's nice. It's a nice feeling, I guess. Well, it's a, a testament to your songwriting, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Is You know, you're clearly a good songwriter. And when other people... You know, pick yeah, it up. I, I, it's the songs. Yes, it's nice to know that people uh, like the songs and appreciate the songs. Yes, that's a good feeling. Yeah, fair enough. How good a salesman is Brad that he talked you out of staying at Berkeley to go join a band? How did how did that conversation happen? <laughs> it's a letter. I still have it somewhere. Actually, if I had known, I would have showed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I was like, what did this guy say to Neil, who's at Berkeley, an accomplished musician, going to school, and say, yeah, quit quit Berkeley, man. Come on back. Let's join a band. Well, you know, it, it was it was part obviously a lot to do with Brad, but also the situation there. I mean, Berkeley was probably. At that time, maybe 2,500 to 3,000 students and 800 guitar players. So right away, you're like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I was pretty young. I was 18, I think, when I was there. So I just realized, I mean, I can get into it for, uh, it's a long, kind of a long story, but the best example I can think of is I had I had a pretty good teacher like you have your one-on-one -on -one teacher you can do all these courses right my favorite class was arranging by the way which was really fun um but i was a first year guy just a kid and uh I, i'm waiting outside the door of my private class and the teacher guy lets i can't even remember his name lets out uh his, his student lets out he introduces me to him and he says well this is so and so and he's He's the best student I've ever had. He's going to graduate this year. He's in his fourth year. He's going to get his degree, blah, 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 blah. Oh, cool. You know, nice to meet you. And he's friendly enough like that. And my teacher was a good friend of the person that referred me to Berkeley, a guy named Oliver Gannon, who was mm -hmm. who played Fraser McPherson, a jazzoid guy. And he's also in the Vancouver Symphony. Um, so that's how come I got to have this special teacher because he was friends with my personal teacher. Nice. Here in Vancouver. Anyway. So I sit down, you know, ready to start my lesson. I go, can I ask you a couple of questions? He goes, yeah, sure. He goes, this buddy over there who you just introduced me to, who's your best student. So I said, so where, what's, where's he going to end up? What's going to happen? He goes, well, you know, he'll probably be a teacher. 
Um, if he's really lucky, he might get in an orchestra pit, you know, maybe. Uh, maybe he'll do some cruises. And right away I went, fuck me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why am I here? Because I was clearly not the best. And he, this guy was the best. And it's like, oh my God. That kidding? is not what I want to be doing. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was like that weekend, it was Halloween or something like that. And I went and saw, and I'd never seen it before. I never even heard about it. Somebody said, go check it out. It was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I went, this is wild. And this is cool. And then I get the oh, letter yeah. from Brad, like, it's really happening here, man. Like, come on, you know, you only need three chords and we can do this. And I was like, yeah, okay. This is the, I get it on a waste. That's what I want. Life. Yeah. And, you know. My parents were none too happy, but they saved a little bit of money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. So there was a, a bit of an environment that made that letter a little more attractive. Yeah. It was just, you know, it was, uh, you know, I was, I thought I was going to be this jazzoid fusion player, but already I was losing interest in, in just, in the passion for that kind of music. And then this that yeah, letter came, the letter came and the punk rock thing, you started to hear about it, you know wasn't really part of the berkeley scene but it was in boston for sure yeah right you know and you'd see these punks walk by what the hell is this about you know it kind of drew me it wasn't music mm -hmm. this the sort of the once back to the look right there was there was a statement being made and what i was doing was not a statement i was just following very old cobwebby footsteps <laughs> yeah. shake those off yeah now you've what... been at it that you've been at it for a while neil how do you keep um the passion for songwriting and performing like how do you do you have a problem keeping motivated to do that and keeping it fresh and excited or is it still just a matter of hey this is the reward for for you know those are two like different it's, it's on sake. avenues <clears throat> um i guess you're right songs are always there you know um we probably take a little more time than than we could or should i suppose you know, I'm already working on the next stuff, to tell you the truth. But I'm not in a hurry. It'll come. Right. When it's ready. Lot, yeah, a lot of ideas are there. They're sitting there, and I know where it can go. The potential's there, and I don't want to define it too soon and put limitations on where, where it can go. Performing, I don't think we've ever had more fun than ever now. You know, we're really into it, really into the subtleties of it, really into understanding it more than ever. The environment, like I said earlier, you know, reading the whole room and getting everybody involved, and it's just a collective thing. It's the crew, the band, the audience, the the hall, whatever that is, and you just sort of, you, it's like riding a wave. The whole thing is the wave. It's so, so cool, you know. So uh, never get bored of that. I get a little tired of traveling. Got to be honest, you know, getting on. Can appreciate that. Yeah, it's just that's a burnout. Um. But yeah, it's still still fun. Still thankful. It's got to be better than uh well, maybe maybe not. I don't want to be presumptuous, but traveling traveling at this level now, maybe a little bit better than all piling into a van and <laughs> heading oh, yeah. across Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I won't even do a tour bus like I refuse. Right? Like people nice. are like, "Wow, yeah. man, you know, what about tour bus?" No, no, no. Germ <laughs> submarine, man. That is no fun and, you know, yeah, you're driving overnight. And, ugh, I can't handle it. So now your daughter's a musician too, mm -hmm. um, and I know that you do a little bit of music with with her. Will you will you travel with her at all, or do you pretty much stay close to home anytime that you're doing any performances with with Candle? Uh, we did a little tour of Southern Ontario last summer, which was okay. fun, and we had Danny Michelle with us. Yeah. He drummed on four of the songs that we did and co-wrote them. Um, wow, I didn't know you did that. That's Danny's from here. Our, our area. He's yeah. a local guy. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Say hi when you see him. Yeah. Um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, and she's she's well into her own stuff now. And doing, and I just she sent me a couple of mixes and they sound great. She's in Montreal. Yeah, so, um, yeah I was actually I was. I wasn't aware of her before I started researching for the show. And to be honest, I think I ended up listening to a lot more of her music than, than going back in the past for, for the stuff that, uh, th yeah, that I should. knew so well. You should, she's, she's, 
she's unfortunately got the bug, right? Like that's <clears throat> that's why we call it a family curse, which is written behind. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> because she's really good lyricist, excellent singer and songwriter. And I really didn't teach her anything. You know, I think I showed her a couple of chords, you know, initially. And once in a while, I said, you could try that or go that. And now she's doing it all on her own. Um, but then she's learning how tough it is out there, you know. And that's sure. why we don't tour a lot because there's no money in it, right? I think the little tour that we did with Danny, um, you know, I don't know. It grossed about 10 grand and it cost mm -hmm. about 12 <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's, and we that's were trying tough. to be lean. We were trying to be yeah. lean. So, so Neil, I, fill in the gaps for me because I, I, you know, when I'm having conversations with people about that, and and I think Danny was the one who's. Uh, I should preface this by saying I know of Danny. I don't think I might have met him once, so I don't want this to come off as like Danny and our great friends or anything. But I did um, hear him in an interview say one time, like I think one of his songs may have gotten like a million hits or something on Spotify, and he made enough to buy a new refrigerator was his yeah. comment on that. And so that's sort of the state of, of where it is right now in terms of, um, you know, are you making money having hit songs and it's not. So if you're not making money selling your music and, and touring is not making money, then how is anybody surviving? Like I thought the tours were where people actually did make money and t-shirts and, and what have you. Yeah, that's, that's the case for 5440 for sure we still we do okay i mean there's a lot of gigs we can't do because we just can't you know we have a standard right right we we generally like to have uh yeah certain standard of sound system lighting you know crew like to put on the makes sense or if you want to hear the songs the way you want to hear them or you want your audience if you're the promoter then it's going to take this much and then we have a manager and an agent you know that kind of grind it out to say well that's what it's going to take and then the band has to get paid so there's right. just, there's a certain number and and one-offs for instance you know if there's a one-off out where you guys are or you know it would have to be a heck of a lot of money to make it worthwhile to fly everybody out there and set it all up and play the show and then go home and so makes sense three we can string together uh, yeah, younger bands like, you know, Candle, and she's not that young. I mean, she's got four albums out or something like that. Yeah. Uh, pretty decent following in Quebec, though, so that's good. Um, I don't know. It's almost impossible, right? It's almost impossible to sort of come away with it. Where do you make the money, you know? Yeah. It's, you need patrons, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's a little concerning. I know we just had uh, Mohawk. Music College announced that they're canceling their uh, advanced music program. Now they're going to run it through. The, the kids that are in it now are going to see it through, but they're not taking any more students. And uh, our own symphony went bankrupt this year. So yeah. I'm just starting to see, like, there's some ripple effects. I don't know if it's, I don't want to blame COVID, but I just, I don't know where people's uh, priorities are maybe not with the arts. And I, I know that a lot of kids aren't getting together and, hey, let's form a band like they used to in high school. So, you know, it's a little concerning. I love it when people pick up an instrument it's therapy right for sure uh you know i think about this a lot and i'm not sure if i formulated any strong conclusions at all uh, it's certainly not like it was but i still think that it's powerful in a niche kind of way right you still find bands you still find young bands kids uh you know i'm not even gonna say they're young but a band called peach pits doing quite well from out here i never really had heard of them until a couple of years ago but i know they tour europe and all over the world and they're they're you know they're a rock combo right yeah i hadn't actually come across them before i'll have to check them out half moon runs another one those are friends of my daughter's quite a bit they do quite well uh so you know there is a scene but it's very niche now in the sense of all the things that culture and entertainment can be part of whereas music at least it seems to me, used to be more significant uh, back in the day. People still spend money, though, right? Like, look at Taylor Swift, sold out mm -hmm. in a half second or whatever. You know? Right. And, and once again, you know, those are the superstars. They're going to be watching TV for their 500 bucks. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And know. they might they might have a better, I know this is say, sort, of, sort of counter to what we were talking about before and the vibe of being there live, but you know, for a thousand dollars a seat, maybe you should go see the movie because I think you'd probably at least see her and hear her and great sound and stuff as opposed to being 10 miles from the stage. I don't know. Yeah. You know? And I, I, once again, I, I can't formulate my conclusions yet, but I think people 
once they buy into that thing, they're in, you know, right. You know, they change their mind. It's almost, it's almost like a religious fervor or something. And they're mm-hmm. going to be determined. They're going to go crazy and have a great time and say it was awesome unless something happens. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's, that's just, I don't understand it myself, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, as, as a, as a writer and a creator, um, what, is your opinion on like we talked about streaming and, and stuff like that? So now with the introduction of a uh, of AI and I don't even know what's that what's the website chat something anyway whatever yeah, G- G- yeah there you go it's yeah there you go they, they should have like you know dear yeah. chat GPT can you come up with a better <laughs> acronym for yourself <laughs> yeah that's right I don't know I my my stance has always been, look, you know, songwriting is a, a reflection of the human experience and it always has been. That's why you get, uh, you know, wartime songs, you get uh, depression era songs, that sort of thing. And I, I don't know how concerned we need to be about whether it's going to start messing with the creativity of our, our songwriters. I just don't think it can hack it, but you know, I'm not a technological genius either. So maybe I'm wrong. What do you, what do you think, Neil, where do you stand on that? There's a very good article, maybe you've read it by Nick Cave on that, uh, where he talks about that, the humanity of of music and the songwriting and the experience and the suffering and the beauty and whatnot. Uh, and that's what makes it critical. It's funny, you know, uh, I did a couple of things. Um, you know, I just, I just went and got it on my computer just to see what the hell would happen. So I said, Write me a love song in the style of Ian Curtis from Joy Division, Bob Dylan, and Robert Smith from The Cure. And, and wow. it, almost as I finished set that sentence, blah, 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 and out it comes. Like, wow. It was so cheesy, but it was like, oh my God, that's so darn quick. And then so uh, I did do a house concert when my daughter was visiting we, out here in a, a little town called Ladysmith. And uh, do you know this town, Lady Smith, on the on Vancouver Island? No, 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 I haven't been on the island. Oh, okay. So uh, we had a two set thing, and it was about fifty people. It was really fun, and we did our own songs and family curse songs and all this stuff. And during the intermission, I had printed out from Chat GPT. I said because my daughter is pretty good at rapping, like she doesn't do it publicly, but she can spin it off like that because that's her culture that she grew up in, right? Right. Uh, but it's always a, and as, as a sense of humor. And uh, uh, so I had asked Chat GPT without telling her to come up with a uh, rap song about Lady Smith. And that's where Pamela Anderson's from. Pamela. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's her hometown. Okay. And this is this is where the house concert was. So uh, I sprung it on her and, you know, came up with a little beat and a loop thing. And she's like, what the hell is this? But she she nailed it and she rattled it off and then, i my god this thing was so funny and it's hilarious anderson had talked about the, the local coffee shop it like it made all these references and the crowd went absolutely nuts that's awesome and then we auctioned off the lyrics that i had printed out for a charity a local charity it was crazy um <laughs> so i don't know if that makes it good or bad but it was it was it was fun i, I mean I, I don't think you need it i mean the, the where it comes in, there's another funny meme, and you might have seen it. Um, or I don't know, I don't even know what, what, like a little, I guess it's a meme. I don't even know what a meme is, to tell you the truth. But where these guy, this guy is watching the Grammys, mm-hmm. and a songwriter goes to, and it's like, and he's all excited, and it's like, it's, and the writers are, and it's like a list of 15, 20 writers, so like he's getting bored because they keep naming. Yeah. Right? You listen to one of the hit songs that's out there, like especially in country music, whatever, there's there's 15 writers. And you're like, my first instinct is, how is that creative? How is that expression of where someone's at, right? It's a formula. And yeah, you know what? Maybe chat GPT would be better than 15 guys. You don't have to pay 15 guys or women or whatever anyways. And if you're trying, yeah. just trying to write a pop hit in the in the Max Martin vein, you know, what the hell? It's formula anyway. Music so. is really changing. I went to see a talk that Alan Cross did about a month ago. So he does the history of new music for mm-hmm. anybody that's not uh, not familiar. Um, and he was talking about how m- music is, is changing and the fact that you have musicians that are mm-hmm. just now using the computer to create their music. 
They yeah. aren't picking up a guitar. They're not, you know, sitting behind a kit. And I wonder what that means for live music uh, moving forward as you have more and more people that are creating in, the, in this way. Well, I mean, I've heard some pretty good stuff created on a on a laptop. I think that's what it was created, and it's not, you know, I mean, Billie yeah. Eilish. I wasn't really a fan. I was kind of anti Billie Eilish because of the hype. But then yeah. my daughter said, "No, you should check this out. Listen to this. Listen to this." And I went, "Okay." And it's just her and her brother in a bedroom and a laptop. I went, "Fuck, that's not bad." Yeah, I I was the same as you. Um, yeah. I you know I couldn't I couldn't bring myself to listen. Uh, yeah. But then I spent some time on it. Yeah. yeah. But getting back to, you know, like sometimes like back in the Sony, when we were on Sony music, you know, they'd want to, they have this writer room and they want to put people together to write songs. And I was always confused by that. It's like, well, why, you know, I can understand like uh, uh, Lennon and McCartney or, you know, Keith and Mick partners, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, even, even though they didn't really collaborate. Um, but why put Joe and Schmo together to write a song for, you know, Lucy I, I I never got that like, and I so once in a while I still get people ask if they want to write song if I want to write songs with them and I'm kind of like yeah maybe but but why right what don't you have something to say on your own like right. I think everybody has something to say and everybody's valid I mean maybe it doesn't sell maybe it doesn't sound as good as the public would like but that doesn't mean it's not valid at least it's your voice. I've got lots to say, you know, and I, I don't need anybody else. I'm not looking, you know, I could tell you stories, which I can't publicly, so I won't, but if people like, oh my God, we haven't had a hit, so let's grab so-and-so, and they grab so-and-so and still don't come up with a hit. And it's like, but why would you, you know, you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of why you got into this in the first place, I would assume. Neil, you can you can tell those stories. Nobody's listening. I don't know. Did someone <laughs> tell you that this was a popular podcast? Like you could just name names, brother. Like let's let's go. Let's hear the story. Oh, no, I mean, it, you know, <laughs> I mean, you can go back to the, the, this. Uh, a lesser current one would be this. Just say, Lover Boy. I think got some of the guys in Foreigner. Maybe it was Mick Jones to help them write a song. And I think that was a hit actually. But then I, I remember, and I know a couple of those guys. I'm like, well, why would you do that, right? You know, it's like you're chasing that that's the reason you know you, yeah you lost your vision don't you just love to rock and do you like this is my music man like let's do it yeah I, I, and otherwise be a cover band you know which is fine yeah you know? i can thing. see that cool. i can see that i think there's some merit though to maybe you know if i've if i've written a song and i think you know it it needs to be tighter it needs to be cleaner it needs something and and maybe saying, well, you know, I like Neil's style and and he's got a different vocabulary than I do. Is there a different way of saying this? And But maybe that's not so much co-writing as having a song doctor, you know, and I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and I've done a lot of song doctoring uh, for people or, uh, and, you know, that sometimes comes under the realm of producing as well. Right. Or arranging, right? right? Like yeah. Translating it that, but, you know, right. I I don't produce so much anymore, but when I did, you know, they'd come back into the room and hear it. And I go, well, that's what you played, you know, or that's what you sang, or that's what you said. You don't like it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we were talking to Jason. Uh, I don't know. Do you know Jason Barry? He's out on the East coast now, but he's from here and he's a, he's a country guy. He's a, a great guitar player, plays for uh, uh, Brody. Um, Adrian Brody uh, Dean, or... Dean Brody. Brody. Okay. Um, but anyway, but he's also a producer and we were just having a chat about, Hey, if you've got a song that's good, it can be produced in many different ways. It could be a jazz song, country rock, like depending on the producer and, and the vision, you can do all sorts of things with it. And it makes maybe more sense in, to do it one way than the other. And so, Absolutely. you know, I, I guess in that sense that there's a lot of co-writing going on besides just the one person who put uh, lyrics to the yeah. paper. Yeah, how, do you, I, how do you and Brad do it? Let's get to that because we're talking about 5440. How do you and Brad yeah. do it? Uh, well, it's the whole band. You know, okay. okay. Like for instance, the West Coast band record started during COVID when we got all on Zoom calls like this and we just started telling stories about the past and each other, and it was all fun. And then after the Zoom call, I just start with a riff and say, We're gonna call this one, you know, uh, table for one or whatever, which is about Matt the drummer. And I would just spew it out. 
And then I'd send it to them and then I'd say, you know, why don't you come up with something and we'll work this through. And that's, that's sort of how that record happened. That's cool. Did that's you find cool. it difficult being a part yeah. as you, as you put together the record? Not in this case, actually it was, yeah. it was necessity kind of made it work, you know, cause we're still yeah. under, under whatever it was quarantine or whatever. And, you know, Matt would just record, some drums i would sort of play to a click track and do a little guide vocal and he'd play some drums and then uh brad would play some bass to that and then dave would play some guitar my brother would play some sax or keyboards and then we that was sort of the structure of the song and then we yeah as things loosened up uh it worked out that we would get together in a studio and play it properly tighten it up a little more and you know that's how that record happened Records happen in a lot of different ways. We always have a sort of a formula or not a formula, but it's like picture yourself in a in your kindergarten class and today we're going to work with just crayons and construction paper, you know, or today we're going to work with glue and, you know, balloons. I mean, that's we like to set limitations on how we're going to create and make a record. Mm -hmm. We usually stick with it with there's always an exception to the rules, but that's 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 the process that we start to go into and then the songs evolve from there it's fun yeah i think the timing was good though at least that you know when you release the album you can tour behind it as opposed to some people they would release an album just as we we're going into covid and nothing yeah, they can't even I, tour that album i mean we yeah I, I don't have a lot of control over when and how things get released that's a lot to do with our manager um you know, there's so much that gets released out there. It's crazy. Like, I think during COVID, there was a million records released for some stupid number. Uh, and that's that's fine, I guess. It's just hard to know, hard to sift through stuff like that. But getting back for one second, you know, to, to song creation, okay? So, mm -hmm. so there's, there's writing. That's one thing. Then there's song creation. That's sort of recording and producing. And like you said earlier, presenting the song. It could be jazz. It could be da-da-da. Right, like that that TV show Westworld that was on for a while on HBO. Remember it, and they did all these beautiful saloon tic tac piano versions of these amazing, like Cure songs or Radiohead songs, and yeah. it was like, wow, that right. is so feeling. Um, but I'm I'm rem <clears throat> reminded of uh, Prince's when when doves cry. You know the song when doves yeah, cry. Yeah, great song. So the biggest thing that he did with that song is he muted the bass. There's no bass in that song. There was there's a whole bass line. But if you listen to that song, there's absolutely no bass. It's just interesting. It's doing chords and a great drum beat. And that dun, 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 that little keyboard line. Right. Yeah. This is gone. And that's probably what made it a hit. You know, I'm guessing. I mean, it's a theory. I haven't heard the yeah. bass line. Maybe it's out there. I don't know. But I know that from interviews and stuff, there was definitely a bass line. And, uh, you know, he was the genius musician that played everything anyways. And he just said yeah no baseline sometimes wow. a little thing like that that just takes things and then you really a hit a hit is you know my definition of a hit that's something that hits people boom yeah wow. right what is that i want to hear it again i like it it hits right and uh who knows how that works and why or whatever so little happy accidents you know all the time you hear about We've used the the word formula a lot in this chat. And I, I think that is, if you're chasing a formula, I guess we all have formulas, but if you're always chasing the formula, I think you're going to be one step behind all the time, you know, and Nashville's famous for, you know, you mentioned country music and how, you yes. know, 15 writers and what's that all about? Well, you know, their, their four bar, eight bar intro, and then verse, verse, chorus, verse, bridge done. And you're done. I mean, that's, that's been so formulaic that there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of creativity coming out that way. So maybe, I don't know, rock has probably a little bit more flexibility that way. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, rock, you know, it's funny. Uh, rock is, once again, it's, it's become a niche thing, which is good in, in the sense that a lot of us oldies reminisce about when it was everything. Yeah. And, you know, but even I, you know, if I hear new rock music, I kind of like, hmm. <laughs> not sure you know if i want to hear these sounds right now and you know you listen to the pop radio there's no guitar maybe an acoustic guitar you know that's looped here and there right there's guitar in, in almost all music that's popular these days and you're like hmm 
but you go see a band and you play one it's like no this is cool and like i said it's it's kind of boutique and niche you know the whole nashville thing yeah it's formulaic you know i don't know i mean it's once again that's those people are chasing that i find that there's a lot of people i know and know of that there's some a, a hit on the radio and then there's 10 songs that sound just like it and if you go get your teeth clean at the dentist you know the receptionist will be singing all of them you know it's and it's like okay that's fine you know that's for the that yeah kind of people that don't really you know music's just sort of there in the background and it's as long as it's palatable and it's about some sort of love song that's fine you know but if you want something a little deeper then you'll find it i suppose yeah. you know i don't know i think that's why i like jason isbel so much and his lyrics are a lot deeper and there's a ton of really great guitar playing going on in that yeah what's the guy that did north richmond north of richmond what was that big North by Northeast or uh, Northeast. That's no. just the name of the album. You mean? No, he's a, he's a, what's his name? Let's make sure I got it. Producer, Dave Cobb. No, he's a country singer, but he accidentally became number one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I oh. don't know who that would be. No, no. I know who you're talking about. It, it, we're, it, we're just talking over the last few months, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Oliver yeah. Anthony. You know the Who's song? That? You don't know the song? Oliver <laughs> Anthony, Rich Man, North of Richmond. It's an amazing song. Yeah. And it's this guy that basically lives out in the country in Virginia or somewhere and redheaded guy in his late thirties, I guess. And just, just got a little following films, you know, singing his song on his iPhone, sending it out there. And all of a sudden he did this song, I guess it was in the late summer called Richmond, North of Richmond, you know, um, about the politicians in, in Washington and the song resonated like crazy. Yeah. He, he he usurped Taylor Swift and some other country artist to number one in like a week. Yeah, Lance, you'll have to wow. check that out. Out of yeah. nowhere. And it's a powerful song. And it's another it's it's beautiful example of how a song can connect. And word of mouth does make that happen. It's hard to get through all the noise, but there's an example that it of happening. Now he doesn't need 16 co-writers, right? No. Yeah. He was number one on the country charts for for an iPhone song. Seriously, so wow, it can happen. Sure, you just got to get through that tsunami of other music. Yeah, and 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 I, even me saying it can happen is the wrong thing to say because I'm implying that success or millions of followers, right? The guy's just bloody authentic. You may agree or not agree with some of what he has to say, but he's coming mm -hmm. from the right place, and that's what people connect to. How do you connect to someone coming from the right place when there's 25 of them? You know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't understand that. You know, I can't yeah. really Max Martin and Sweden. I mean, whatever, right? Sweden was hockey players. <laughs> that's about as far as I can go. <laughs> no, that's, that's for sure. Oh, go ahead. Neil, do you have one? Uh, I know we've taken up a lot of your time. I was going to ask you for one uh, road story from uh, 5440 that you can tell. Um, I know you guys were the one I've, I've heard that yeah, I can't remember if it was you or Brad talking about just, you know, stumbling across the tragically hip. They were heading east or west rather to do a tour. You guys were heading east and you met them at a 7-Eleven uh, back in the day. Something like that. Is, has there been any disastrous road tour stories or one that, ones that just turned out fantastic? Not so much. No, it's, I mean. Remember, I we have no listeners. You free, speak freely. No, I, I, I'm trying. I, I, I <laughs> I can elaborate on that one a little bit, I guess. Uh, you know, you always you always seem to know. I can give you three examples like that one that that includes that one. Let's just say where a musician recognizes another musician. You know, a scenester recognizes another scenester. It's just right. a thing. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what it is. Um, so with the hip guys, yeah, we were heading. I guess east they were heading west. It was in Brandon at a gas station. Might have been a Seven Eleven too. I don't know. You know, so they they're either piling in the van or we're piling out of the van, and we just sort of like I don't know who they were. They didn't. Maybe they didn't know who we were. I don't know. But you could tell, long haired dudes. Yeah. You know, what the hell else is it, right? <laughs> and so you know, we had a little conversation. Oh yeah, you're heading west. Oh yeah, we're heading yeah. You know, ever since then we've got to know them a heck of a lot better, but. Uh, another time I was in a chapters, this would have been about 
I don't know, 98, 99, maybe. Um, you know, the chapters used to have all the CD sections. Right. Yeah. Music, like you could go yeah. listen. That's why I like this. Yes. Yeah. You, you could listen to something and see if you liked it, and then you could buy it, CDs. And uh, I'm walking out of the store, and uh, somebody's walking in, and it's this guy. He's kind of got a shaved head, and he's shorter than me. But just that look, like, oh, yeah, you're a musician. I don't know who you are, but I know you're a musician. You know, you're probably some guy from around town. I don't know. And, uh, well, I was leaving, and he was going in. I can't, Or I was going in, he was leaving. That's what it was. I, anyways, as I go in, uh, the, the uh, clerk comes up. Do you know him? Do you know him? And I said, no, but, you know, and then that's Michael Stipe from R.E.M. It's like, oh, OK. Huh. You know, just <laughs> same thing when we met the Stones. It was so like just after the initial handshakes and, you know, just being freaked out by the whole experience, settling into just musicians talking. And yeah. we had worked with some people they worked with and they were just like, yeah, how's old so-and-so doing? Yeah, he's fun to work with and, da -da 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 -da, you know that that kind of kind of environment is uh i don't know it's kind of cool that there's a camaraderie there there's a respect for the craft uh, and respect for what you do and you realize that you're kind of serving that institution and the music you know when when you asked me before about how does it feel to have written this song or that i mean it's the song i'm a steward for the song right Song came out. It's great. We we helped deliver it. We still deliver it. But it's the song itself that people like. And that's the good feeling. I don't own it. It's not me. You know, they don't know me. I mean, why, how would they? But they know the music. And that's, yeah. and I respect the music and they respect the music. And that's where we meet. Right. So that's the cool thing. I love that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, Neil, thank you for spending time with us today. It was it's really nice getting to know you. Um, we usually end up with a, a lightning round question thing that that Andrew does. It is a very unscientific yet fast way to get to Neil uh, to know Neil. So <laughs> I will let Andrew yeah, okay. yeah. give it a shot. These are great questions. They're yes or no's, whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, A or B. You just you choose whichever one it uh, whichever one it is. So we'll start off for a rapid fire round: records or cassettes records great white north or deep south <laughs> i'd probably go deep south <laughs> back porch party or evening at the pub back porch party how about books or audiobooks books and blues or folk blues that sounded like a tough one <laughs> Well, I like <laughs> I like folk music. I like acoustic blues. So I like yeah. folk music and bluesy. Let's just say that. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Hendrix or Van Halen? Hendrix? Are you kidding? There's like <laughs> that's like that's like the galaxy or a, a speck of dirt. I mean, come on. <laughs> I love it. Uh, <laughs> documentary, documentary film or horror? Documentary. I don't deal with horror. <laughs> <laughs> It's too much on the news. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um, sunrise or sunset? Sunset. I, I rarely catch a sunrise. Love the sunsets. Nice. And last but not least, Mondays or Fridays? Mm, Fridays. I'm sad. Sad to say I'm in with everybody else on that one, probably. Nice. Well, that has been another episode of Backstage Lowdown. So you can tell me my personality now, huh? From the yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Very well, we can't. We just we send the results off to some professionals. We have them analyzed, and then it gets put back it to in us, your so. chat GPT. Chat GPT. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, that's happened. right. Uh, then we use that analysis. Then I go back to the West Coast Band album, and I just analyze the heck out of it. It's fantastic. It's a pretty <laughs> literal album. I don't think there's much to get. <laughs> um...